All right, if you'd all like to turn to Genesis chapter 25 and um, verse 19, and we'll begin with prayer. Lord, thank you so much for inviting us to yourself to be saved. Thank you this morning for inviting us into your house to learn of you. Thank you, Lord, for the day when you will we'll stand at the door and you'll invite us and say, come into my Father's house. There's a mansion prepared for you. And we praise you for that in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Now, Genesis chapter 25. And uh, follow along, please. Verse 19. These are the generations of Isaac, Abraham's son. Abraham begat Isaac. And Isaac was 40 years old when he took Rebekah to wife, the daughter of Bethuel, the Syrian of Padanaram, the sister of Laban, sister to Laban, the Syrian. And Isaac entreated the Lord for his wife because she was barren. And the Lord was entreated of him, and Rebekah, his wife, conceived. And the children struggled together within her, and she said, If it be so, why am I thus? And she went to inquire of the Lord. And the Lord said unto her, Two nations are in thy womb, and two manner of people shall be separated from thy bowels, and the one people shall be stronger than the other people, and the elder shall serve the younger. Okay. Now, and when her, sorry, verse 24, and when her days to be delivered were fulfilled, behold, there were twins in her womb, and the first came out red, all over like a hairy garment, and they called his name Esau. And after that came his brother out, and his hand took hold on Esau's heel, and his name was called Jacob. And Esau was three score, sorry, Isaac was three score years old when she bare them. All right, now, in our last study, we, we, we started in verse 19 with a consideration of that important Hebrew word, teledoth, and, and we saw that in verse 19 where it says, these are the generations, these are the teledoth of Isaac, which is Abraham's son, Isaac begat, uh, uh, Abraham begot Isaac. See, the striking part of verse 19 is, is, is that exact same teledoth word appears in verse 12, speaking about Ishmael, when it said, these are the generations, the teledoth of Ishmael, Abraham's son, whom Hagar the Egyptian, Sarah's handmaid, bare unto Abraham. And the exact same teledoth word appears in verse 13, speaking of the sons of Ishmael, where it says these are the names of the sons of Ishmael by their names according to their teledoth, their generations. And we considered this Hebrew word teledoth that's been translated as generations, and we saw how special that word is because it doesn't mean history. It doesn't mean history. Verses 19, 12, and 13 are not saying, and this is the history of Isaac and the history of Ishmael and the sons of, of, of Ishmael because teledoth doesn't mean history. Teledoth means generation, or, and it's a good choice that they use for that, that word because it really means to generate. It means to bring forth. So verses 19, 12, and 13 are saying to us, this is what Isaac and Ishmael and the sons of Ishmael, they generated or they brought forth in their lifetimes. And, and what's significant about what Isaac brought forth in his lifetime is two verses down, where it says in verse 21, and Isaac entreated the Lord for his wife. See, what Isaac generated or brought forth in his lifetime were these momentous, significant prayers to God. And that, moved, and that moved God to, to answer those prayers and, 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 to, and to, to affect an eternal change in the course of history. And we saw that this was in stark contrast to Ishmael and to his sons who, on the, uh, who, uh, uh, who brought forth or they generated relatively unimportant, trivial, insignificant towns and castles that, that like grass appeared temporarily and then they were cut down and then burned into smoke and just disappeared into this historical blur of vain accomplishments. And so looking at verses 19, 20, and 13, it causes us to see this, 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 this difference in between the teledoth generations of Ishmael and his sons and, and the teledoth generations of Isaac. And, and that causes us to see that just as there was a personal teledoth history, a, a generation, or bringing forth for Isaac and for Ishmael and for the sons of Ishmael, there's a personal teledoth for each one of us in this room. And, and the searching question that confronts each one of us right now is, 
How is our personal teledoth, our generation, shaping up for our lives? I mean, God would say, how about it? Look at it. Look at your lives. Do, do, do we have, or, or will we have, a blessed teledoth bringing forth the generation like Isaac did of intense prayers to God that move God to, to, to answers that change eternal history? Or, or, and, and there are two, really two tragic teledoth histories that, 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 that are all too common. And, and the first tragic teledoth history is where the lost, with no concern for the salvation of their soul, they expend, they exhaust themselves in expending their lives by building uh, fame and fortune and businesses and buildings and organizations, and, and, and etc., like Ishmael and his sons, and they just fade away into a blur of vanity, which is what the Lord Jesus Christ spoke of in Mark 8, 36 through 37, when he said, for what shall it profit a man if he shall gain, if he shall gain in his teledoth history, in his teledoth generations, if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? And, or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? See, the question the Lord Jesus Christ was asking is, what's the profit for a man who, 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 who keeps himself from giving any attention of how, 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 how God has provided for his soul's salvation because he's just so busy making a teledoth generation of gaining the whole world and ends up losing his soul. And the second tragedy is for a believer who, 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 who is, is, is choked by the cares of this life, the deceitfulness of riches, who goes after those deceiving rich, riches, and also his tell of history, it, it, it just generates, just kind of goes into a blur of wood, hay, and stubble that, that, that like smoke just disappear. Now, we read the next words in verse 19, which are, and these are the generation of, of Isaac, Abraham's son. Very important, Isaac begot Abraham. See, those next words in verse 19 of, of identifying Isaac are key to us understanding what's going to develop now from here on out in several chapters. Isaac is identified as Abraham's son. And, and again, this causes us always to look back and compare with verse 12 where it says, and these are the generation of Ishmael, Abraham's son. The Omebar, the Egyptian there. See, in that verse, we see how Ishmael is described with exactly the same words, exactly the same way as Isaac. Both are Abraham's son. They're sons. And see, so from verse 12 and from verse 19, we see both Ishmael and Isaac are described in the same way. They're Abraham's sons. And, and after all, all we've seen about how spiritually opposite Isaac and Ishmael are. It's surprising to us to see in the same chapter how, how they're both described as Abraham's sons. And, they, and, and they, because they were both Abraham's flesh and blood. They had the same DNA. They had DNA traceable back to Abraham. And, and we can imagine that, that Ishmael presenting himself, is he present himself as a full-blown son of Abraham. Just like Isaac. He says, well, I am a full-blown son of, of Abraham. I am a fu I'm fully Abraham's flesh and blood. Just as much, uh, Ishmael would say, just as much as Isaac is fully Abraham's flesh and blood. See, Ishmael would say, he would say that he was Abraham's seed just the same as Isaac was fully Abraham's seed. Flesh and blood, flesh and blood, flesh and blood, flesh and blood. And, and if Ishmael were questioned by us about, about him being from Abraham, Ishmael would say, oh, I'm Abraham's son. And, and we would agree with Ishmael and say, yeah, we have to agree with you. You are Abraham's son. And Ishmael would say, I'm the seed of Abraham. And, and, and we would agree with Ishmael and say, yes, yes, we agree. You are the seed of Abraham. And, and after all we've read about Ishmael's teledoth or what he generated in his life, we would say, no, but, but, but Ishmael, there's a difference. There's a difference between you and Abraham. I'm mean, sorry. Yeah, yeah, well, yeah, you and Abraham and, and Isaac. Because, because Isaac is more like Abraham than you are. 
And, and it has to do with your teledoth compared to, to, to Isaac's teledoth, Abraham's teledoth, or, or what they brought forth in their life compared to what you brought forth in life. So if Ishmael would say, uh, say, I am a son of Abraham, I am Abraham's seed, we would say, 100% Ishmael, yes, no contest, you are the son of Abraham, you are Abraham's seed. But being a son of Abraham or the seed of Abraham does not really address the issue. So if Ishmael will say to us, well, uh, I'm a child of Abraham, we draw the line. We'd say, no, no, Ishmael, 100% no. When you said you're a child of Abraham, we stood up and we said, no, you're not a child of Abraham. See, Ishmael, when you said you were a son of Abraham, we'd say 100%. No contest. When you say you're a child of Abraham, we say no. And if Ishmael to say, why? What's the difference between being a son of Abraham and being a child of Abraham? And we'd explain to Ishmael, we'd say, well, <clears throat> to be a son of Abraham or to be Abraham's seed, that's physical. That's all about flesh and blood. That happened at conception. You didn't have any choice to that. You had nothing to do with that. Like the Ethiopians who come to us in Ethiopia and, say, and they say, the only reason we're Muslim is because, uh, because we were born and they told us, you're Muslim. And so we, we didn't choose. There was no choice about it. And, 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 and so with Ishmael, we'd say, you can't change that by any choice of your own. A zebra can't wake up one morning and say, I, I don't want to be a zebra anymore. I want to be an elephant. You know, <laughs> a zebra can decide all he wants, but, but, but he is, he will always be a zebra because that was determined at conception. And that's the same with Ishmael. See, a child, on the other hand, follows his father. Uh, a child is a child because he decides to follow his father. And we would say to Ishmael that, that from how your personal teledoth compares with Abraham's, you're not following Abraham. You're not following. In Abraham's teledoth, Abraham builds altars to God in Genesis 22.9. Where in Ishmael's, in Ishmael's son's teledoth, they build castles and towns to themselves in Genesis 25.16. But, but in Isaac's teledoth, Abraham, like, like Abraham, Isaac is building altars to God. In Genesis 26, 25. And, and in Abraham's teledoth, Abraham calls on the name of God. Of the, he calls on the name of the Lord in, in Genesis 21, 23. Where, where, where in Ishmael's, and Ishmael's sense teledoth, there's no record of them calling on the name of God. There's no God on the name of the Lord. There's no record. But in Isaac's, like Abraham's, there's a record. He's calling on the name of the Lord. In Genesis 26, 25. So it's because of the personal choices in life that resulted in the personal teledoth that Ishmael is not a child of Abraham, but he's Abraham's seed. Okay? Both Ishmael and Isaac had the flesh and blood of Abraham, but only Isaac had the spirit of Abraham, and only Isaac was a child of Abraham. Both Ishmael and Isaac were the seed of Abraham. But only with Isaac would, would a person look at Isaac and say, you know what, like father, like son. You never look at Ishmael and say, well, like father, like son. No, it's different. The difference is all about choices. It's not about heredity. I have two nieces, and, and they are identical twins from my brother. And, and, and as identical twins, they have exactly the same DNA. That's what it means when they're identical twins. They're not fraternal twins. They're identical twins. They have the same DNA. As identical twins, they have the same heredity. They are identical twins. One's a lesbian, married to another woman. The other is straight, married to a man. They're both the daughters of my brother. They're both the seed of my brother, but they're not both followers of my brother. They're, not, they're, they're both not children of my brother and my sister-in-law. And, and my sister-in-law made it very clear to my niece who's the lesbian. Anyway, <clears throat> this is the difference 
between being a son of Abraham, uh, the seed of Abraham, and being a child of Abraham. And that was the difference between Ishmael and Isaac. And that was the difference between, and that is the difference between, it was and it is, between the majority of the Jewish people who reject God's Messiah, the Lord Jesus Christ, and the minority or the remnant of the Jewish people who embrace God's Messiah or the Lord Jesus Christ. The issue came down to this point where the Lord Jesus Christ made this difference between son and, and, and seed and child crystal clear when he said in John 8, 33 through 40, he said, they answered him, we be Abraham's seed and were never in bondage to any band. How sayest thou, you shall be made free? Jesus answered, verily, verily, I say unto you, whosoever committed sin is the servant of sin, and the servant abideth not in the house forever, but the son abideth forever. If the son, therefore, shall make you free, you shall be free indeed. Then he says, I know that you are Abraham's seed. No contest, 100%. You are Abraham's seed. You are Abraham's flesh and blood. You are sons of Abraham. Yes, but, he said, you seek to kill me because my word hath no place in you. I speak that which I have seen with my father. You do that which you have seen with you, father, with your father. They answered and said unto him, Abraham is our father. Jesus saith unto them, if you were Abraham's children, so he's saying 100% no. If you were Abraham's children, you do the works of Abraham. But now you seek to kill me, a man that had told you the truth, which I have heard of God. This did not Abraham. Same thing. Isaac and Ishmael are forever identified as Abraham's son or his seed. But only Isaac is the child of Abraham. And just as all the Jewish people forever identified as Abraham's son or seed, only the remnant of the Jewish people who, like Abraham, have embraced Jeho Jehovah Jesus are children of Abraham. And today, you may not be Jewish or a physical descendant of Abraham like Ishmael was, but by embracing Jehovah Jesus, you're like Isaac, a child of Abraham. It's more important to be a child of Abraham a spiritual son of Abraham than to be a physical son of Abraham. Pastor Rahan, he led me to the Lord Jesus Christ. And in my mind, I am always his spiritual son. Paul identified Timothy as his son when he said in 1 Timothy 1, 2, unto Timothy, mine own son in the faith, grace, mercy, peace from God the Father, the Lord Jesus Christ. See, generally, it, generally it's, it's, it's accepted, it's viewed. Paul didn't have any physical children. He didn't have any children, never spoke of them, but he had many spiritual children, he didn't have any physical children, many spiritual children. And he talked to, to the Corinthian believers that way. When he said in 1 Corinthians 4, 15, he said, for though you have 10,000 instructors in Christ, yet you have not many fathers, for in Christ Jesus I have begotten you through the gospel. See, Titus, he identified Titus as his son in the faith when he said in Titus 1, 4, to Titus, mine own son, after the common faith, grace, mercy, peace from God the Father, Lord Jesus Christ, our Savior. See, Onesimus was Paul's son in the faith. He said in Philemon, Philemon 1.10, I beseech thee for my son Onesimus, who I have begotten in my bonds. See, Paul, didn't, he, he, he had these spiritual children. And what's interesting about when you look at the spiritual children of Paul is that you know, it wasn't a situation like he just had these spiritual children and you left them on a street corner to fare for yourselves. He, Paul travailed for his spiritual children. He said, till Christ be formed in you. As he said in Galatians 4.19, my little children of whom I travail in birth again until Christ be formed in you. In other words, just saying, I travailed in birth for you to be born again. I'm travailing again for you until Christ is formed in you. As a parent, Paul was gentle toward his spiritual children. He said that in 1 Thessalonians 2.7. We've been hearing about that. But we, but we were gentle among you even as a nurse cherisheth, cherisheth her children. As he has a spiritual father, Paul exhorted his children, he, co he comforted his children, he charged his spiritual children, and he said this in 1 Thessalonians 2.11, as you know how we exhorted and comforted and charged every one of you as a father doth his children. Okay. Now, we read now in verse 20, Isaac was 40 years old when he took Rebekah to wife, 
the daughter of Bethuel the Syrian, and Padanaram, the sister of Laban the Syrian. See, we see those clear words. Isaac took Rebekah to wife. And we know from the last verse, the last chapter, that he not only took her to be his wife, he not only took her into his mother's tent, he not only took her to be his wife, but he took her to love. It says that Isaac fulfilled the marriage vows where he would say, I, Isaac, take thee, Rebekah, to be my lawful wedded wife, to have and to hold from this day forward to love. See? Isaac took Rebekah to love Rebekah. And even though, as we saw in our last study, they were as different as North Pole to South Pole in their personalities. With great differences between them, Isaac decided to love Rebekah. And because Isaac loved Rebekah, their home was a happy home. And we'll see that, 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 that the upcoming birth of their twins put a great div- difference between them. Where, where Isaac will favor Esau and Rebekah will favor uh, Jacob. You know, that's a formula for a giant explosion. That, that's a formula for a, for a nuclear explosion. But because Isaac loved Rebekah, their home was a happy home. And, and it's interesting that nowhere do you read that Rebekah loved Isaac, but you only read that Isaac loved Rebekah. And even though it doesn't say that Rebekah loved Isaac, but only that Isaac loved Rebekah, their home was a happy home. And, and, if, and if, one, if just one spouse in a marriage will love the other one, even without the reciprocal love, their home will be a happy home. And, and there, there does not have to be love between both spouses for a home to be a happy home. If only one spouse loves the other spouse, their home will be a happy home. That's what make, made Isaac's home a happy home. Three words that describing Isaac in Genesis 24, 60, 67. He loved her. He loved her. Now, we read of a problem, and we saw this in our last study, is that Isaac's, Rebecca is described in verse 21 as she was barren. See, that described a physical problem. She was barren. Uh, and the, and, and and the most wonderful description that we have of Isaac, we just saw in verse 21, is that and, and Isaac entreated the Lord for his wife because she was barren. And the Lord was entreated of him, and Rebekah, his wife, conceived. See, Rebekah was barren. It was a physical problem. And Isaac entreated the Lord. It's so wonderful to just read those simple words, Isaac entreated the Lord for his wife because she was barren. It's so wonderful that verse 21 doesn't read some other way. It's so wonderful that verse 21 doesn't read, and Isaac resorted to a human plan for his wife because she was barren. It's so wonderful that verse 21 doesn't read, and Isaac turned to an Egyptian handmaid instead of his wife because she was barren. when, when, When Abraham had the same problem, Abraham did just that. He turned to Hagar and, 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 and he was sorry for that. And then in sorrow, he turned to the Lord. And it's so wonderful that verse 20, 21 doesn't read, and Isaac turned to the gods of the land for his wife because she was barren. You know, I'll never forget when I would go to, 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 to visit customers in Tokyo, and I'd stay at the Shinjuku Hilton, and walking from Shinjuku Station, it was only a few blocks, the hotel at night, and as I'd leave the, the Shinjuku Station, uh, see all those stands of palm readers and tarot card readers and spiritual seers and the Japanese people just going one right after the other. And here in San Diego, all those places, that's just the same, the spiritual readers and so forth. And someone told me one time, well, if it works, it must be okay, whatever works. It's so wonderful that verse 21 doesn't say that Isaac turned to the gods of the land. It's so wonderful That uh, verse 21 doesn't say, and Isaac turned to the physicians for his wife because she was barren. See, that's our reaction to a health crisis. A health crisis comes to us, how soon can I get an appointment with a specialist? Well, I got to go find a specialist. I'll ask my friend, who's the best specialist? How soon can I get an appointment? Where's the best clinic? I got to go get treatment there. It's amazing just how much harm clinicians cause in, in, in 
<clears throat> I mean, Hippocrates, he couldn't have said something better in his first oath. Don't do, cause any harm. <laughs> and, and, and in Mark, it describes this woman uh, in, in, in Mark 5, 26, a woman who just kept passing blood, hemorrhaging, passing blood, anemic, passing blood. And, and it says in, in Mark 5, 26, and had suffered, she had suffered many things of many physicians. <laughs> That's a good badge for physicians to wear, right? Suffered many things of many physicians. Yeah. And had spent all her, all that she had. Don't, don't, and don't forget that part. And had spent all that she had, and then the next part. And was nothing bettered, but rather grew worse. You know? mm. So uh, <clears throat> who would like to sign up to go to medical school now? <laughs> so this poor woman had visited many physicians, and they damaged her in many ways. And she spent all her money on those physicians under their care, and she just got worse. But what makes 21 so wonderful, verse 21 so wonderful, is that it describes a habit of life with Isaac. And when, he, when he faced a crisis, he turned to the Lord in prayer. I mean, it reminds me of a problem Jean uh, she had with her phone. And, and, and Jean's phone hasn't been working because the water line broke under her home. And, and so at 4 a.m., she told me, 4 a.m. in the morning, she woke up concerned about her phone. And, 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 so, and so what did she do? Did she, 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 she grab her cell phone and, and call the all-night number for the phone company to come out quick and fix my phone? No, she prayed at 4 in the morning. And, and in the middle of her prayer, she heard static on the receiver that was left off the hook. The line was restored, four in the morning. That's better than, than being on hold with the <laughs> She didn't, she, see, she, that's what she did. When a crisis comes, why'd she do that? Because when a crisis comes, a habit of life is to turn to God in prayer. Isaac's habit in life that we're reading about in verse 21, that should be our habit in life. We're faced with a crisis, we turn to God. And Isaac, he didn't just pray casually to God for his wife. He earnestly called on God. He called out to God. You know, Isaac had a passive personality. We've already seen that. I mean, the picture, the, the, the classic picture of Isaac is following Abraham up Mount Moriah. You know, that's a picture of the life of Abraham. Father, where's the lamb? God will provide. Okay, I'll follow. You know, that's Isaac. That wouldn't be Rebecca. <laughs> that, that picture of Isaac in, 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 in chapter 24, verse 63, Isaac went out to meditate in the field at Eden, e eventide. That's a picture of Isaac. He is a calm, retiring, meditative type of person. And being a second born to Ishmael, he had many of the following, following type of meditative characteristics of a second born. I mean, Isaac, you, you want to be with a pleasant person, you want to be with Isaac. He's just like, he's pleasant to be around. He's nice. You know, he, he's not causing any waves. And he may have been passive, but when it says in verse 21 that Isaac entreated the Lord, there's nothing passive about Isaac here. As a matter of fact, the Hebrew word is, 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 that's, uh, that's behind this word entreated is the word atar. And atar is from a primitive root that means to burn incense. And, and, and so it's really, what, what he's really saying here, it's, a, it's more like a worshipful pleading to God as an intercessor. The word atar is used in, uh, in Exodus 8.8, 8, where it says, Then Pharaoh called for Moses and Aaron and said, Entreat, atar, the Lord, that he may take away the frogs from me and from my people. I'll let the people go and do sacrifice. See, here was, here was uh, Pharaoh. He's suffering tremendously. Frogs everywhere. Frogs in his bed, frogs in his clothes. And, he, and he's begging in a worshipful way. He's begging, intercede for me. Uh, go worshipfully plead with, 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 to God to take the frogs away. See, that's the same word, atar, that's used here to describe how Isaac is interceding for Rebekah earnestly. It's not, just a it's, 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 it's not just a description of, you know, Lord, could you please do something about it? No, I mean, he is really into it. He's very earnest. It's just like the description of Elijah, where it talks about how he, when he prayed for rain in James 5.17, it, it says, and Elijah, Elias says Elias, Elijah, was a man subject to like passions as we are. And he prayed earnestly, 
that it might not rain, and it rained not on the earth by the space of three and a half years. And he prayed for it not to rain, sorry. See, so he prayed earnestly. When it says he prayed earnestly, behind those words, the Greek text uses the word prayer twice. So it's really reading, Elijah prayed in his prayer. See, it portrays for us that Elijah's praying, and as he's praying there, we're sort of like stepping out into overdrive in his prayer. It's like Elijah stepped out of the formality of his prayer. He stepped out of, the, uh, 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 of how he normally prayed, I don't know. And he really reached out to God. He prayed in his prayer. Which raises the question as to why did God allow Isaac to not have children for so long I mean, uh, that it brought Isaac to this place of desperation of having to pray so hard for a child. I mean, it was God's will that he should child. Why? The answer is that God did not want this seed of promise to come naturally. But God wanted this seed to come by prayer as a confirmation this was from God. And sometimes that's what God does with us. We know that something is the will of God, but it's not happening. And like Isaac, we have to pray earnestly. Why? Because like Isaac, God wants us to have that answer to prayer that, with, with a clear sign on it that says, not naturally, but as an answer to prayer. Now, now when it says in verse 21 that Isaac had treated the Lord for, uh, for, his, for his wife because she was barren, those words are interesting, for his wife. The Hebrew, nakach, it, it, it means on the behalf of his wife or in the place of his wife. See, see, he had his own pain. See, Isaac had pain over the infertility, but Isaac felt Rebekah's pain, and that caused him to, play, to pray nakach in her place. See, that's the kind of praying that God wants us to pray, where we, where, where we not only have the eyes like we talked about, not only have the eyes of compassion, but we have the heart of compassion. It's so easy for us to, to, to leave our houses and we see people, but we don't see anyone. And, and, and we listen to people, but we don't hear anyone. And, and we touch people, but we don't feel anyone. Because we want to protect ourselves from being disturbed, from being upset. So we build this layer of protective insulation around us called hardness of heart. But God wants us to feel the needs we're praying for. And, and he wants us to get into their shoes of the people we're praying for. He wants us to see through their eyes. He wants us to feel through their hearts. And, and then we can pray as Isaac did, nakach, on behalf or in the place of, uh, of Rebekah. That's true intercession. And that's how the Lord Jesus Christ intercedes for us when it says in Hebrews 4, 15 through 16, we have not a high priest which cannot be touched with the feelings of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. See, he's touched with the feeling of our infirmities. It means that the, the, when the Lord prays, he, he's praying nakach in our behalf. He's seeing through our eyes. He's feeling through our heart. Now, we read in verse 20 that, that Isaac entreated the Lord. And, and we talked about last week, how long was this period? It's made clear to us. He was 40 years old when he got married. He was 60 years old when these boys were born. So we saw that this was 20 years. This was 20 years. That means that after the, you know, they, they, the first, Isaac didn't waste any time. First, he takes her into the tent. All right. So after the first month, they waited and they saw she's not pregnant. You know, they didn't have first response at that time, pregnancy test, but they had last response, which was just, anyway. <laughs> and, so, and, and, and so they went in, and so it's, one month later, she's not pregnant, and this goes on for 20 years. And each month of the 20 years, they waited to see if Rebecca was pregnant. T for 20 years, that's 240 months. That's a lot of months. 240 months, 240 times they waited to see if Rebecca's pregnant. 240 times they see that she hasn't conceived. You know what that shows about Isaac? Patience. Patience. You know, they asked Hudson Taylor one time, what are the requirements for a missionary coming in China and then mission in China? And he says, there are three requirements. He said, the first requirement is patience. The second requirement is patience. And the third requirement is patience. <laughs> So when it says that Isaac entreated the Lord, we understand 
Prayer requires patience. 20 years of praying and waiting. That teaches us in order to become strong in prayer, we need to become strong in patience. Waiting, like it says in Hebrews 10, 30, 10 35 to 36. Cast not away, therefore, your confidence, which have great recompense of reward. For ye have need of patience, that after having done the will of God, you might receive the promise. See, the answer to Isaac's prayer was coming, but he had to wait. And sometimes after we pray, we have to wait and not give up because the prayer doesn't come immediately. The answer doesn't come immediately. That, that doesn't mean it's not God's will. Isaac waited for 20 years for the answer to his prayer. That's what makes prayer so difficult. If prayer was simply, uh, I, I see a need, I ask God for the answer, and the answer comes immediately, the prayer wouldn't be hard at all. Prayer, what's so hard about that? But prayer involves waiting. And, and if we are not prepared, if we don't prepare ourselves for waiting, we'll give up. We'll simply give up. Just how hard is it to wait in prayer? I mean, if we're to prepare ourselves for the difficulty uh, of, uh, of, 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 of waiting in prayer, how, how, what should we be prepared for? It's an interesting description that tells us what to expect in this matter of waiting in prayer. And you might want to turn to it. It's in Numbers 8, 25 through 24 through 25. Numbers 8, 24 through 25. Because it's an interesting word here. And, 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 it, and it describes for us, it gives us an insight as to what we're getting into when we commit ourselves to prayer and the work that we need to be prepared for. Numbers 8, 24 to 25 says this. This is that belongeth unto the Levites from 20 and 5 years old and upward. They shall go in to wait upon the service of the tabernacle of the congregation. See, they shall go in to wait upon the service of the tabernacle, see? And from the age of 50 years, they shall cease waiting upon the service thereof and shall serve no more, see? Wait, when they're 20, start waiting, doing their work of waiting, uh, when they're 25, and they stop 25 years later. And it says, this work belongs to the Levites. Wait, waiting. Now we're particularly interested in this because when we read about Levites, we know that Levites were the priests and we're called to be priests. We're called to be priests, as we already heard this morning, in Revelation 1.6, where it says, and God hath made us kings and priests unto God and his Father. And the job of a priest is to represent man to God. So when we read about the Levites, we focus in specially because we're reading about what God has, made, has, has, has called us to be. When we read about the Levites, we're reading our job description. And so as a Levite, as a priest, the job of the Levite was to pray, was to wait. As those multitudes of Israelites came to, 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 to the tabernacle with their offerings of their sin sacrifices so they could be forgiven by God, with their offerings of their thanksgiving sacrifices for the goodness of God, for their offerings when they, when they dedicated themselves wholly to God, for their offerings of their supplications for their needs. See, the priest was not just a butcher. He didn't just sit there and say, okay, bring them up here, cut them up next. That's not the priest. The priest took on his heart those sorrows when a person came with, for, for, because of sin, for forgiveness. He took on his heart those joys when a person came with thanksgiving. He took on his heart that, that courage when a person came, he wanted to dedicate himself especially to God, had an offering. He took on his heart those yearnings when a person came with supplications, requests to God for answers to prayer. And you can see the Levite goes out of the tabernacle, goes about his daily business there, walking in the crowds in the market and whatever. And the next time the priest would see that person, he would say, ask him, say, oh, did God answer your prayer yet? Because your yearning's on my heart. How about it? And that's the primary work of a priest. He was, he, it was a heart work as he took on his heart the burdens of the people who they came to him. And, 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 and so that's why he would do that. And that waiting part was hard, as it says there. It, it used to be churches had, had a, 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 it used to be churches had a midweek prayer meeting where prayer needs were discussed and prayed over. But the waiting part of prayer is hard work. So the midweek prayer meeting in the church has been replaced by a midweek church service. So the question is, 
Just how hard was this waiting part on, on the Levites? Well, it's interesting, when you're looking there at Numbers 8, 24, it says, this is that that belongeth unto the, the Levites, 20 years, 25 and upward. They shall go in to wait upon the service. See, the, the, the word belongeth, that really brings it home. It tells the primary work of the Levite was to wait. And, and, and he starts when he's 25 and, and so forth. 25 years, he's got to do this. It's all about waiting work, waiting work. And what's interesting is the Hebrew word that's used to describe the waiting in, in, that, in that chapters, chapter 8, verses 24, 25. The word waiting there is the Hebrew word sabah, sabah. Now, now, let me just read to you so you get a picture of what this meaning of this word sabah is. I'll read to you another uh, place in Numbers 31, 7, where the word is used. And they warred sabah against the Midianites as the Lord commanded Moses, and they slew all the males. See, the Midianites were bitter enemies of the Israelites. And the Israelites went into these battles with them, and they were swinging those heavy swords till they had hacked up and killed all the males. And that's hard work. Slaying and slewing is hard work. And, 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 and that sw swinging the sword hard work warfare, it's called sabah. And at the end of each day of warfare, you can imagine the Israelites exhausted, killing all those Midianite men. And the word sabah is used to describe this hard work of warfare. That's the word that's used to describe the word wait in, in, in the Levites. Hard work. You know, the, the, the Levites didn't go into physical battlefront in Israel. They were exempt from military service. But they did go to the battlefront of prayer. And, 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 and in Exodus 17... When Joshua, with Israel, fought with the Amalekites in the valley, Moses is on the top of the hill, and he's holding out his hands, as it says in Exodus 17, 9 through 12. And Moses said unto Joshua, Choose us out, men, and go out and fight with, the Mal with Amal Amalek. Tomorrow I'll stand on the top of the hill with the rod of God in my hand. So Joshua did as Moses said, said unto him, and fought with Amalek. And Moses, Aaron, and Hur went up to the top of the hill. And it came to pass, when Moses held up his hand, Israel prevailed. And when he let down his hand, Amalek prevailed. But Moses' hands were heavy. And so they took a stone and put it under him. He sat thereon. And Aaron and Hur, the Hur st stayed up his hands, the one on the one side, the other on the other side. His hands were steady until the going down of the sun. See, Moses was not on the physical battlefront in the valley. He wasn't down there with Joshua fighting with the Amalekites, but he was on the hill fighting just as hard, holding his hands out in prayer, his arms out in prayer. And, 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 and we saw just how hard it was for Moses because his hands were heavy, and Moses got tired standing. That's the reason I, uh, I as a kid, I was, they gave me violin lessons, but I said it was too hard to stand. So that, uh, resorted to it, it doesn't matter. Anyway, so Mo Moses, he gets tired of standing, and he's holding up his arms, so they get a stone for Moses to sit on, and, 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 and because of his tiredness, he, he sits there, and, and, and also because of his tiredness, he starts to let his hands down, and then, and then Israel begins to lose the battle. And so he holds up, he gets help, holds up his hands. It's hard work. Why didn't he keep holding his arms up? Because it's hard. It was the hands were heavy. Hard work. He got tired. He needed help. Shows hard work of prayer. And we see this hard work when we realize in verse 21 that there were there, there, that, that these 20 years between these statements, Isaac entreated the Lord, and the Lord was entreated of him. He had to wait 40 years before he got married. That was hard on everybody else also. And then he had to wait 20 years before he had children. Now, it's not uncommon for God to, to make a couple wait a long time before they, they bring someone special into the world. You think of some women who had to wait a long time before they brought in a special person to the world? Sarah, Sarah with a Isaac. Who else? Hannah. Who? Hannah with Samuel. Rachel, Rachel with Jacob. Elizabeth. Elizabeth with John the Baptist. See, there are examples here. It doesn't show God doesn't love these couples because, you know, where, where's the babies? And, and, and so, <clears throat> now... After Isaac entreated the Lord, we read in, 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 uh, in Isaac entreated the Lord for his wife because she was barren, and the Lord was entreated of him. 
See, Isaac entreated the Lord, and the Lord was entreated of him. We can imagine how Isaac was praying. Oh, God, give me a son. You promised the seed that's going to come through me. Give me a son. Now, Isaac was praying for a son. And how did God answer Isaac's prayer? Gave him two sons. <laughs> I'll see your son and I'll raise you a son. He gave him two sons. <laughs> he says, two sons. See, and, and, and there's a word in verse 24 that shows how surprised and how happy Isaac was to see how God answers his prayer for one son with two sons. What's the word? Verse 24, it expresses how uh, the surprise of it all. Just one word. Yeah, behold. He says, behold, that word. We can see Isaac running around, and, and he's saying, I was praying to, for Rebecca to have one son. Behold, there were twins in her womb. You know, he says, he said, and it shows that we might have to wait a long time for an answer to prayer, but when God does answer, it's often more than we expected. Like it says in Jeremiah 33, 3, call unto me, and, and I will answer thee and show thee great and mighty things which thou knowest not. See, in that verse, God is challenging us. You pray, you wait. And, he, and he's saying, and I'll, I'll guarantee you it'll be worth it. I'll make it worth it because I'll show you some great and mighty things you weren't expecting. Isaac, you weren't expecting twins. <laughs> what twins they were. So, <laughs> finally, at the end of verse 21, we, we read, Becca, uh, Rebecca has conceived. See, after 20 long years, hard work of waiting and praying and praying and waiting, finally she conceives. And, and we would have thought that, that finally now, uh, all the troubles are over. Now we've got clear sailing. It's been a long time, a lot of trouble for 20 years. But now we come to verse 22, and the children struggled together within her. She said, if it be so, why am I thus? She went to inquire of the Lord. See, verse 21 ends with this relief. After 20 years, the problem is solved, and Rebecca, his wife, conceives. See, verse 22 starts with a new problem. The children struggled together within her. This new problem comes right on the heels uh, of the old problem. It does, it's a, now there's, this, there's, there's a world war going, a raging war going on inside of Rebecca. As a matter of fact, this home, this home has just one trial after another. See, the first problem we do is read about Rebecca's barrenness. Then the next problem, the struggling of the children within her. Then the next problem, the transferred birthright. Then the next problem, Abimelech takes Rebecca into his harem. Then the next problem, the Philistines steal his Isaac's wells and fill them full of dirt. Then the next problem, he blesses the wrong person. Then the next problem, Esau marries the wrong women. Then the next problem, Esau vows to murder Jacob. Up. Then the next problem, Jacob flees from his home. Apart from that, it was a very no, non-eventful home. <laughs> we should have a home like that. Anyway, so there's just one problem after another. Problems just came into this home like waves. And, 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 and that's a picture of what we should expect in our Christian life. See, like the hymn Constantly Abiding says, the trials of life may surround like a cloud. But in spite of all those trials, it says, there's a peace in my heart that the world never gave, a peace it cannot take away. Though the trials of life may surround like a cloud, I have a peace that's come there to stay, constantly abiding. Jesus is mine. So, we see here in verse 22 that Rebecca is baffled by the problem. And she has a question. And her question is, why? See? Now, 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 we see that Rebecca has learned from Isaac what she should do. She should go to God. This is the first time we're reading about Rebecca going to God. So she goes to God. It's interesting when you compare verse 20, verses 21 and 22 for what Isaac did versus what Rebecca did when they each came to God. What's the word used to describe what Isaac did in verse 21? And what's the word used to describe what Rebecca did in verse 22 when they came to God? Isaac entreated the Lord. Rebecca inquired, went to inquire of the Lord. See, they're not the same Hebrew words. We already saw that the Hebrew word used for, for Isaac, atar, which is this worshipful pleading with the root meaning of incense burning. But the Hebrew word describing Rebecca is, is darash, and it means to investigate or to question. There's a difference. There's a difference between those two words. And, and they're really in keeping with the different personalities of, of Isaac and Rebecca. See, Isaac is, is not asking, why is Rebecca barren? He's pleading with God in a worshipful way. And Rebecca is not pleading with God. She's asking God. She wants to know. She wants to know why, there's, why, why she has this world war going on inside of her. And, 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 
See, for Rebecca, she could deal with the problem if she knew the reason. Isaac didn't care what the reason was. He just wanted to solve it. And each person has their own battle station of prayer. And Isaac's battle station of prayer was worshipful pleading. And Rebecca's battle, ship, battle, battle station in, in prayer was, was asking for understanding. And, and just like the Levites went to their Saba battle stations of prayer, so Isaac and Rebecca, they each went to their Saba battle stations of prayer when a crisis came. And, and so she asked, she asked in, 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 verse, she asked in, then in verse 22, she says, why am I thus? She's asking a question. She said, you know, if God has answered prayer, Isaac's prayer for me to have a child, God has answered Isaac's prayer for me to have a child, why is this, why is this strong jostling going on in me? The Hebrew word there is very strong, ratzatz, ratzatz, it's a very strong word. I'll read to you a place where that is used so you get an idea of how strong that is. It's in, it's, it, it, it describes what happened to Abimelech's skull <laughs> in Judges 9.53 where it says, and a certain woman cast a piece of a millstone, she was up high, cast a piece on a millstone upon Abimelech's head and, 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 it, and all to break, or all to break, ratzatz, his skull. See, the woman took the heavy stone, threw it from above Abimelech, the stone hit his head, broke, broke his skull to pieces. And that's the same word that Rebecca's using here when she describes the struggle. She's being broken to pieces. But and that's going on. She felt it. And she's asking, how could this violent struggle be going on if, if God has, has answered prayer, which, which he has? And so we'll stop here. In our next, next, uh, next study, we'll, be, we'll talk about God's answer, which is a number, too. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for, for recording all of these histories for us so we can understand that Lord, though the trials of life may surround like a cloud, we can have a peace that the world cannot take away. We thank you, Lord, that with all the trials that we've seen in their home of Isaac and Rebekah, that the peace of God that passes understanding guarded them. We thank you too, Lord, for the challenge of Isaac to love his wife, and we pray that in all of these things we've seen in your word this morning, that we would be doers and not just hearers. In Jesus' name, amen.